Uh, hello, I'm Victor Strandberg. Uh, in this session, we're about to take up part five, the final section of the wasteland, what the thunder said. As we do that, we also conclude several cycles of organization in this poem. We move from Earth, in part one, the burial of the dead, to the fire sermon, death by water, and obviously the element of air. The four elements of which material, uh, re material reality is composed according to thinking in the ancient world. We also complete a turn of the wheel of time. We began with the month of April. April is the cruelest month, mixing memory and desire. Uh, we moved on to summer, to late fall, uh, the setting of the fire sermon on the banks of the Thames River. And now we're back to springtime again. Eliot doesn't say that it's actually set in April, but he does begin with the Passion Week of Jesus, which is commonly assigned to the month of April. Now with the mention of Jesus, I think we can say that part five takes up the other possible answer to the sufferings of the wasteland. In part four, death by water, we had the Buddhist nirvana, uh, an escape from the wasteland and its false values, the prophet and the loss, Gentile or Jew, Phlebas being handsome and tall, an escape from all that in the undersea realm that represents unconsciousness, lack of a conscious self, the Buddhist answer. It is quite natural that Eliot in the end would turn not to Buddhism, which attracted him a good deal, which he considered uh, um, adopting as his own religion, uh, but in the end he would turn to his own cultural heritage, the Christian. And in part five here, we bring together both the metaphysical dimension and the ethical dimension of Eliot's thinking, uh, the causes of the wasteland being a deficiency in both realms. And here he would struggle to find a resolution to the sufferings of the wasteland through uh, the Christian view of a long purgatorial life of suffering. I say a Christian answer in quotation marks. He still was not a believer in the Christian faith. Nonetheless, almost as though it is uh, against his own will, uh, the elements of the Christian tradition do impinge into part five here in a number of ways. Now I'll begin with the scene of Jesus' crucifixion. Again, the blank verse is impressive. After the torchlight, red on sweaty faces, after the frosty silence in the gardens, this would be the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus prayed and agonized uh, the night before he was crucified. After the agony in stony places, the place of the stone Gethsemane is where he was crucified. After the shouting and the crying pri prison and palace and the reverberation of thunder of spring over distant mountains, then we get the Easter message with a naturalistic imposition. He who was living is now dead. The Easter message, of course, is the opposite. He who was dead is now alive. But naturalistically, that is impossible that would require an intervention of the supernatural. There is no supernatural. Indeed, there is no spiritual dimension of reality at all. That is why this is a wasteland. So as we bring back the problem of the burial of the dead, there appears to, appears to be at least no, uh, in this session, no answer to that problem. Uh, there is, I think, an interest in or an inevitable attraction to the crucifixion in Eliot's thinking um, as a potential source 
of meaning. But in the end, he shies away. Uh, the, the loss of credibility is too much to overcome. So because he who was living is now dead, we who were living are now dying with a little patience. Proceed now with the basic imagery of the wasteland. Uh, the wasteland, of course, is somewhat of a desert for lack of water. And water obviously has religious implications. Uh, the water in the rising of the Nile River brought fertility. Uh, in the coming of the monsoons in India, likewise. And all of those experiences had religious connotations in uh, antiquity of the remote past. And in Christian thinking, the waters of baptism, of course, allow a rebirth, the myth of rebirth indeed, that is missing from the wasteland. So we proceed then with t wasteland imagery, uh, particularly focusing on the lack of water. Here is no water, but only rock, rock and no water. The road winding above the mountains, mountains of rock without water. And at this point, we have that motif going way back to the beginning of poetry as a quarrel with oneself. That is to say, the naturalistic intellect of T.S. Eliot is giving us a world without a myth of rebirth. No way to cope with the burial of the dead as we go into part five. Nonetheless, something rises up to do battle against that naturalistic intellect and it is presented in a series of if clauses, wishful thinking. If there were water, we should stop and drink. If there were only water among the rock. But of course there is no water, dead mountain mouth of carious teeth that cannot spit, dry sterile thunder without rain, Red sullen faces sneer and snarl from the doors of mud-cracked houses. The lack of fertility, and we could apply this in the spiritual dimension as well as literally, the lack of rain, the lack of fertility, the lack of any spiritual potentiality, does lead to the ethical dilemma of the wasteland. People unable to relate to each other properly, spiritually, uh, instead, a state of hostility, perhaps, of the Darwinian struggle to survive, uh, for survival uh, behind it all. Now, we proceed with an even more elaborate if clause at this point, arranged in a rather lyrical style, short lines. If there were water and no rock, if there were rock and also water, and water a spring, a pool among the rock, if there were the sound of water only, the tiniest hope. Not the cicada, the great dry grass singing, but the sound of water over a rock. Where the hermit thrush sings in the pine trees, drip, drop, drip, drop, drop, drop. Okay, all of that is wishful thinking, if clauses. Now we have to face reality, but there is no water. We proceed with yet another cryptic Christian reference. We started with the crucifixion, leading not to rebirth, but to permanent death for the Savior. And yet the Savior reappears. This is around line 359. Who is the third who always walks beside you? Now, this is a reference in the Gospel of Luke and other Gospels to the risen Jesus after his crucifixion, appearing mysteriously beside two of his disciples as they are walking on the road to Emmaus. They don't recognize him. Uh, he d withholds his identity for a, a little while. And then, of course, finally, they do realize with great joy uh, who this stranger is walking beside them. Now, Eliot, as I say, treats this episode, this biblical episode, uh, with some distance. 
That is, he says this is a hallucination in his notes to the wasteland. He says this is a hallucination experienced by travelers in Antarctica. And he cites particularly uh, the explorer Shackleton, who led an expedition to Antarctica. He and his men uh, almost died during the two years that it took for them to return uh, after their ship was destroyed in the ice of Antarctica. And they experienced these hallucinations of someone appearing next to them. Uh, and of course, it turns out there's no one there. In the wasteland, there appears to be someone there. And he does look a lot uh, like someone from the time of Jesus dressed in a brown robe. Who is the third who always walks beside you? When I count, there are only you and I together. But when I look up ahead the white road, there is always another one walking beside you, gliding wrapped in a brown mantle hooded. Who is that on the other side of you? Uh, I would say this is another version of those if clauses, the wishful thinking, the wish for a Messiah, a savior, the hanged man that was missing from the deck of the Tarot pack. But we have to leave that now. Perhaps it is just a hallucination, like those visiting the explorers in Antarctica. We go now to World War I. What is that sound high in the air? Murmur of maternal lamentation that sounds like it is the three Marys around the foot of the cross, witnesses to Jesus crucifixion. But of course, here it is also the millions of mothers whose sons were slaughtered in the recent Great War. And in the aftermath of the war, we had chaos, particularly in Eastern Europe. Uh, in his notes, T.S. Eliot cites Hermann Hesse, who describes the hooded hordes swarming across Eastern Europe. I think clearly Eliot is thinking of the Bolshevik Revolution. And to him, this was an instance of barbarian hordes uh, rising up in the East. Who are these hooded hordes swarming over endless plains, stumbling in cracked earth? That's a wasteland too, spiritually, certainly. Uh, and then we have, I think, a reference to the violence of World War I. What is the city over the mountains? cracks and reforms and bursts in the violet air, falling towers, Jerusalem, Athens, Alexandria, Vienna, London. Now those cities represent the great centers of civilization going back for thousands of years. Athens, Jerusalem, the two great pillars of Western civilization. Alexandria, of course, a magnificently a cultured city. Uh, Vienna, more recently, the center of a continental empire. And London, uh, the British Empire, the greatest in history. The point, I think, is that all of these cities were caught up in World War I, in the madness of, uh, and violence, and in the insane aftermath of that battle to make the world safe for democracy, the war to end all wars, as Woodrow Wilson had it. We follow that, uh, rep uh, that um, reference to World War I and its immense destruction and futility and the chaos that it bred. We, we follow that with a surrealist episode. T.S. Eliot did go to the museums where surrealist paintings were being exhibited. He was very interested in this expression of the unconscious. Surrealism had as one of its purposes to express the unconscious. It's rather hard to do, of course, if you're not conscious of what's there. Uh, but we let that paradox stand and follow Eliot's imagery. Basically, to describe the spiritual the cultural chaos following the collapse of belief systems in uh, the war and just after. A woman drew her long black hair out tight, fiddle whisper music on those strings. 
and bats with baby faces in the violet light whistled and beat their wings and crawled head downward on a blackened wall. Uh, well, yeah, the aftermath of the war and the violence that followed the war in Eastern Europe, in Ireland, potentially in many other places. Upside down in, in air were towers, tolling reminiscent bells. I, I suggest these are probably church bells. Uh, voices singing out of empty cisterns and exhausted wells. I think part of the wasteland imagery, there's no water there either in the church. Uh, there are no spiritual uh, springs of water to drink from. What comes next is the chapel perilous episode described in From Ritual to Romance, Jesse Weston's book that Eliot followed uh, quite um, intently in this poem. In the chapel perilous episode, the knight seeking the Holy Grail uh, must have a close-up encounter with death. And the point in, uh, in that episode is that in Europe, uh, the cathedrals and churches were surrounded by graveyards. And so by approaching the chapel, one does come up close up to an encounter with death. And here the chapel is described again in some excellent blank verse. In this decayed hole among the mountains, in the faint moonlight, the grass is singing over the tumbled graves about the chapel. The chapel, of course, is unoccupied uh, because a uh, belief is impossible in the wasteland. There is the empty chapel, only the wind's home. It has no windows and the door swings. Dry bones can hurt no one, the bones in the graveyard. Only a cock stood on the roof tree, and we hear the cock crow, coco rico, coco rico. And then something changes, a flash of lightning and a damp gust bringing rain. Now, essentially what is happening here is that T.S. Eliot is giving up on the metaphysical problem of the burial of the dead because of the impossibility of belief in the supernatural there can be no myth of rebirth, and we simply have to turn our back on that problem. However, it may be possible even in a naturalistic environment to do something about the broken ethics of the wasteland. Perhaps men do not have to treat each other like animals. Perhaps they can assert some kind of willpower uh, so that uh, the sufferings of the wasteland may be alleviated. And we proceed as we come now to the last section of part five. We proceed to, to examine three ethical imperatives that T.S. Eliot puts forward. Because Christianity is discredited, we cannot turn to the Sermon on the Mount or the Ten Commandments for ethical injunctions on how to live our lives. And so Eliot will turn instead to a much older religious heritage, the Hindu. He goes to the Vedas, the Upanishads, and from them he brings forward these three commandments. Uh, prior to announcing the first of these, he whips up a thunderstorm. It is beautifully done in terms of the verse texture. Uh, texture. Uh, we're going to the Ganges River now, uh, where, of course, the um, Hindus would gather for an especially devout form of worship. Ganga was sunken, and the limp leaves waited for rain, while the black clouds gathered far distant over Himavant. The jungle crouched, humped in silence. Then spoke the thunder, Da. Well, the translation of Da is give. 
and that's immediately followed by a question, data, what have we given? In Jesse Weston's book, The King of the Wasteland, the Fisher King, is wounded and infertile for that reason. And he waits, and the whole wasteland waits in its drought-ridden condition for a hero to arrive and ask the right question, at which point the king will be healed and the wasteland made fertile. Now in this case, the question, what have we given, uh, does get an answer. And it is an answer that pertains to one of the most torturous forms of suffering in Eliot's poetry to, death, to date, sexual intercourse. What have we given? My blood, oh, excuse me. What have we given? My friend, blood shaking the heart, the awful daring of a moment surrender, which an age of prudence can never retract. By this and this only, we have existed. We can think of so many examples of this. And I, I like to think of the presidents of the United States, President Kennedy, uh, President Bill Clinton, uh, Vice President Nelson Rockefeller, uh, many other politicians, of course, in high places in America and elsewhere, who have come to grief. Uh, they've risked uh, everything they've lived for in a strenuous lifetime for the pleasures of sexual intercourse. And so it's an extremely powerful, dominating force in most people's lives. And this is what has mainly been given to each other. What have we given? We have to give more than that, is Eliot's point. For proper human relationships, we have to go beyond the typist and the young man who came to assault her. We have to go beyond uh, perhaps the tragedy of Philomela, raped by King Tereus. We could go back to portrait of a lady, the wench is dead and I killed her, the young man thinks, and Prufrock in his loneliness, losers in the sexual competition. That whole genesis of suffering through human sexuality uh, needs to be overcome, and there has to be a better answer to the question, what have we given? If there is a better answer, that would alleviate the sufferings of the wasteland. He goes on and describes sexual intercourse in some very ironic terms. By this and this only we have existed, which is not to be found in our obituaries. Well, that is true. In President Kennedy's obituaries, there was no mention of the incredibly large number of trysts, some of them, I think, uh, very much to be frowned upon, and not for Puritan reasons, but because of abuses of the women. Uh, and of course, we could think of all kinds of other examples uh, of this purpose of living, by this and this only we have existed, which is not to be found in this official document about a man's life, the obituaries, nor uh, are those sexual encounters to be found in memories draped by the beneficent spider? If you do keep a diary, for God's sake, don't put everything into it. Nor is your sexual turpitude to be found in other documents uh, that uh, pertain to your life and which are left over after your life is over, such as the seals broken by the lean solicitor. That would be your will and testament and you wouldn't mention uh, these episodes there. We conclude that answer to the question, what have we given, with a poignant phrase, that the descriptions of this purpose, by this and this only we have existed, uh, and the ongoing aftermath in these documents, all of this has not alleviated the loneliness that um, we found as one of Eliot's major themes going back to Prufrock. So we end with the phrase, in our empty rooms. We pass on then from what have we given, and it should be more than sexual intercourse, my friend blood shaking my heart, 
the awful daring of a moment surrender which an age of prudence can never retract. We go on to the second commandment. Deyanvam, translated as sympathize. These commands, of course, coming from Hindu sacred writ uh, because it is more credible for Eliot and perhaps his intellectual peers than the more recent Christian versions. Sympathize. Now here the metaphor is one of being locked into solitary confinement. I've heard the key turn in the door once and turn once only. You are being locked into your cell. We think of the key each in his prison. That is hoping to hear the key turn again in the lock and releasing us from that solitary confinement. He mentions a broken Coriolanus because Coriolanus is one of the loneliest characters in all of Shakespeare. A man who has broken relationships with every form of community, culminating in his broken relationship with his own mother. We move to the third of these commandments, Damyata, which means control, give, sympathize, control. If these commandments are followed, they would alleviate the sufferings of the wasteland, uh, this long purgatorial endurance of suffering as the answer instead of the Buddhist nirvana. The metaphor for control is sailing a boat. This was the one and only athletic uh, enterprise that T.S. Eliot could indulge in. Uh, his family had a, a mansion on the coast of Massachusetts in Gloucester, and he did like to sail. And so we have the, uh, the description of the boat under perfect control. The boat responded gaily to the hand expert with sail and oar. The sea was calm and so forth. To, to controlling hands. We conclude now in the last stanza with the Fisher King. I sat on the shore fishing with the arid plain behind me. Uh, clearly the few drops of rain did not uh, make the wa wasteland fertile. And at this point a question intrudes, perhaps on the Fisher King, perhaps on Tiresias the main narrator of the poem, and certainly on behalf of Eliot himself. Shall I at least set my lands in order? The words or the phrase at least is significant. It's a minimal kind of effort. By following these commandments, give, sympathize, and control, perhaps some degree of order might be created within this larger chaos. But is it even worth doing, especially in light of the burial of the dead? It's an open question. Shall I at least set my lands in order? No sooner than he says that than we have an image of disorder, of chaos. London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. Eliot liked to use children's rhymes with adult significance. Uh, so maybe the search for order cannot be answered successfully. Uh, we have uh, uh, several of his excerpts from literature of the past. He is a classicist in this way. And he has one from Dante's Purgatorio, which haunted him and continued to um, be found in his later Christian poetry. I'll translate the Italian from Dante. It's from the circle of the homosexuals who are being burned with flakes of fire coming down from the sky. Uh, in purgatory, they do have some hope of escape eventually, after the suffering has been endured for a set number of, of years. Uh, so um, the translation is, he, this homosexual in purgatory, hid himself in the fire that refined him, the refining fire of suffering, a theme that Eliot would take up in his Christian period but he's not really a Christian as yet. His conversion is still five years away. And so clearly his thinking is sort of being oriented toward uh, a Christian view, but it still remains incredible. And perhaps only uh, these few 
consolations of uh, an ethical resolution to the wasteland can be contemplated. There's a re reference to swallow, swallow, uh, and uh, as the notes tell us, this is a reference to Philomela's sister, Procne. Philomela was the victim of sexual assault, raped by King Tereus, who cut out her tongue so she couldn't communicate. And Procne is her sister who shared to some degree in her punishment. And uh, so both girls were turned into birds. Philomela into a nightingale, Procne into a swallow. And I think that's the reference here, just a reminder of the fire sermon of the source of so much suffering in Eliot's poetry up to this point. Now, another, I think, very significant phrase, three lines from the end, these fragments I have shored against my ruins. When we look to see what fragments, I think mainly it is those three ethical commandments. It, of course, would also be other excerpts from the literature of the past, uh, some of them religious excerpts, uh, bringing a few drops of rain, perhaps. And uh, so, um, Eliot is struggling to achieve a positive resolution to the wasteland, doing the best he can, considering the naturalistic view of life that lies behind all this. These fragments I have shored against my ruins immediately then again a collapse into chaos, as happened with London bridges falling down. Uh, the chaos is represented in a play, The Spanish Tragedy from Shakespeare's time. And the speaker, why then I'll fit you, Hieronymo's mad again. Hieronymo is, is experienced chaos because his son has been murdered by the son of the king. And Hieronymo gets justice by contriving a play within the play in which, as part of the act, he will kill the king's son, who in actual life murdered Hieronymo's son. Well, in the play within the play, Hornomo actually does kill the king's son to achieve justice. But nonetheless, he slips in and out of madness. As we can infer, in a certain fashion, T.S. Eliot is doing in this poem, or at least has a speaker doing in the poem. As he tries to alternate once again back to a more positive conclusion to the wasteland, we repeat the three commandments, data, dayadvam, damyata. And we add three Hindu blessings, shanti, 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 which Eliot says corresponds to the peace that passes understanding in the Christian tradition. So he's being as Christian as he can without actually asserting uh, his role as a believer, uh, something beyond his reach at this time. I'm going to take a moment to look at the notes of the wasteland to conclude our study of this poem. I've already mentioned some of the important notes. We should note along the way that, um, in, in essence, what Eliot does in the notes is to open the door of his workshop and invite us in for the look. And now we can see the odds and ends, the jumble of assorted um, excerpts from literature of the past particularly, uh, which went into the making of this poem. Uh, we have, of course, a very wide net indeed uh, cast to bring in these still viable excerpts from the literature of the past. Uh, parts of the Bible, Ezekiel, Ecclesiastes, uh, Wagner's opera, Tristan and Isolde, uh, the Tarot deck is mentioned in some detail, Baudelaire, Dante's Inferno, uh, Shakespeare again, Antony and Cleopatra, the Aeneid, Milton's Paradise Lost is Sighted, the story of Philomela from Ovid's Metamorphosis, uh, the game of chess in Middleton's play, Women Beware Women. Uh, we move to uh, part three, the fire sermon. The notes tell us he's citing Spencer, Edmund Spencer, Prophylemy and Sweet Thames run softly till I end my song. Citing the Tempest, citing Marvell to his coy mistress, a favorite source for Eliot. A fairly long passage on Tiresias that we've mentioned already, the main narrator of the poem. Uh, we have uh, the 
passage describing Queen Elizabeth's love affair with Lord Robert Dudley, and uh, in the biography of the Queen, Robert Dudley uh, caused one of the workers on the palatial estate to tell another worker, uh, Lord Robert hath swived the Queen. Swive being a, a word for sexual relations uh, back in that time. Reference to Purgatorio, St. Augustine's Confessions about the cauldron of unholy loves that sang all about my ears. The complete text of the of Buddhist fire sermon, Augustine's Confessions. And then when we get to uh, part five, the notes explain Shackleton's expedition to Antarctica, the parallel to the appearance of Jesus on the road to Emmaus, Herman Hesse's description of Eastern Europe in a state of chaos, the three commandments, data diad bam damyata, the source of those, is uh, cited in the um, notes. And there's one thing in particular that I want to cite in detail to close this session. There is a note to uh, line 411 about T.S. Eliot's dissertation on a philosopher named F.H. Bradley. He, he finished the dissertation. Uh, all he had to do was go, go back to Harvard and have his oral exam a mere formality, and he'd be a PhD in philosophy. But he never did that. In the dissertation about F.H. Bradley, uh, he cites Bradley's book, Appearance in Reality, and he gives us a very men memorable, even poignant or haunting description of the loneliness that has afflicted so many of his characters, and we infer Eliot himself. He's quoting F.H. Bradley now, who is describing this kind of loneliness. My external sensations are no less private to myself than are my thoughts or my feelings. In either case, my experience falls within my own circle, a circle closed on the outside so that every sphere is opaque to the others which surround it. The whole world for each is peculiar and private to that soul. Uh, communication then is simply impossible, and human communion is impossible in that case. Uh, so the resolution to the wasteland then leaves the burial of the dead as an unanswered metaphysical issue, and it leaves us with a sense of loneliness that could be alleviated, along with the other sufferings of the wasteland, through the three Hindu commandments, give, sympathize, control. And that is about as far as he gets in resolving the problems of the wasteland. Uh, we'll go on with his next work, The Hollow Man, in our next session. <laughs>